Hi, everyone. Welcome again to uh, another session in the podcast. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Moed Amin. I'm uh, delighted to have my guest today, who is the um, founder of a couple of SaaS companies uh, that seek to help you know, businesses understand the uh, new buyer and uh, fundamentally change the way sales is happening today, right? So really looking forward to this discussion. <clears throat> He's also the host of uh, two popular podcast shows, the SaaS Stories and uh, the Buyer Side Chat. So please help me welcome someone who, along with his work on evangelizing a different approach to sales, um, someone who also holds uh, three U.S. patents as well, which I found interesting, uh, Mr. Subhanjan Sarkar. Subhanjan, uh, very good to have you on the show today. Welcome. Thank you, Moid. I'm uh, delighted to be here and uh, chat with you about sales. I mean, <laughs> we'll, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping to learn a few things from you myself. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to learn things from you, right? So uh, <laughs> let's, let's start with, uh, you know, the big question here. Um, mm -hmm. How would you describe say, the, the state of the sales profession at the moment? I would say that we are at a crossroad and one road will take us to disaster, which is what you see when you look at most conversion rates that you see in B2B sales. I'm talking primarily B2B, not so much in B2C. Mm -hmm. And the other, which is guiding the companies which are actually flourishing and growing. The problem with this that we do not see that crossroad at all. It's not a visible crossroad. We like to believe there is none. There is one path and we should just continue going that way. But no, we, we, we are at a, at a juncture where we need to choose. So why, why is it that we can't see the crossroad or that we don't believe a crossroad exists? Yeah, so, so, so I'll not say we'll not, we don't believe, we, 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 we are in denial. And, mm. and the reason to my mind is that the sales leadership is a legacy leadership. These are people potentially my age who are coming from the industrial era mindset mm. where, and, and, and you see that most of the mechanisms that we use to, to sell are actually hand-me-downs from the industrial era which does not con conform to the knowledge era that we are in. It is like saying that you could sell the same way or do business the same way that you used to do in agrarian society and we'll continue to do that in the industrial society. It, it just doesn't work, you know? So, so, so the issue is the whole idea of manufacturing-led selling which is we have this plant, we have figured out how to produce something in great numbers because we can bring down the price, which means we can influence and sort of drive the market to, to adapt it. That mindset drives most of the sales uh, process and mechanisms. And that's the problem. So it's almost, we're almost stuck in a period of, to use an example, you know, a hundred cold calls a day to, to, to achieve to achieve one or two new meetings, <clears throat> as opposed to actually what we should be doing in this day and age, which we have the tools to do, which is more smartly target with a, with more precision the right people, which may take longer to attain those meetings, but they will lead to healthier outcomes. Absolutely, as an, and as an example. Absolutely. And, and I'll just connect it with, with another analogy that we use so much in sales, right? We talk of the sales funnel. The funnel is about getting a million people on the top and have a few hundred come out on the other side. Yeah. But essentially what we are going to, what this era allows us to do is to actually build a pipe where most of who go in come out the other way. But we are still driving our sales. I mean, you see, you just go into any search engine and you see how much of the sales funnel are we still talking about? When you look at conversion rate of marketing, for example, these days, uh, you know, and there are some that try to say, you know, it's, it's, it's 2.5%, et cetera. But the reality is it's less than 1% in most cases. Yes. And yes. in any other profession, 
less than one percent would be a scandal, right? It, it would just be, <laughs> it'll it, be a disaster. It, it would be it, it. I mean, it would be a complete disaster. In fact, in fact, heads would probably roll, right? I mean, if you turned around to an investor and said, "Well, less than one percent of our of our um, of the bets that we make actually gives us any sort any form of profit," they would be out of business. They would lose their money. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, do you feel it's really just a legacy of the industrial age or do you feel that there is more to it than that? You know, why is this being allowed and, and actually even being a, even considered acceptable by a lot of businesses right now? That's a very, very good question. And, and, I'll, and I'll try to sort of respond to that. Human beings love status quo. We all love status quo. Yeah, the safety in it. Yeah. So, so see what's, what, what's that doing to us? See what it did to New York killed 44 people yesterday because we we don't want to believe that there is something called climate change I, I know it's like really a distant thought but but you see where i'm going with this yes the problem with us is that unless somebody hits us in the face we still believe we can avoid it mm. that, that that's number one the other part is that i think it's a it's a huge failure of leadership pretty much like anywhere else you know, when a country fails, you can, of course, say that, okay, you chose this government and you are as much to blame as anybody else. I understand that. You, you, you get the, uh, the, the government that you deserve and so on. And by no means, I want to convert this into a political discussion. But I'm just trying to make a point that we are very, very comfortable with status quo. And we do not want to venture out, stick our neck out. It's like, it's like you know, I mean... Uh, we, we always give this example, right? Who has ever been fired for buying IBM, right? And, and, and that sort of percolates into the system. And when I, why I say leaderships are failing us is because most businesses are not doing very well. I mean, you can talk of Fortune 5000, but we have like 50 million companies. Why are we talking of 5000 companies? Most are sort of uh, cruising to survive, you know, with complex balance sheets, managing cash flow, right? Why is it that most people are not thriving? So it is, I mean, you, you, you are a neuroscientist, so you, you know what I'm talking about. Behavior is very difficult to change. And we are, I think, a slave of that, unfortunately. Mm. That, that, that's the core reason. Of course, there are a hundred other reasons. <clears throat> but yeah. I think that's the core. So where have you... You know, we, we, we've talked about some of the bad behaviors and, and the wrong things that are being done. Mm. Let's, talk about, let's talk about the more positive aspects then. What are the examples of great behaviors um, and great results that you're seeing when it comes to sales in, in the SaaS world or even sales in general or, or the approach of SaaS businesses? What are some of those good practices? Yeah, okay. So this is something very close to your heart as well. The fact is that we ourselves don't buy the same way we used to buy 20 years back. Yep. Whether we are buying a television or a refrigerator or buying a car, our behavior has changed. We know what we do, what we used to do then and what we do now. How much more informed we are, which means we are far more empowered than the car salesman would believe. Yet, we believe our customers are buying the same way. You see the problem? So to, to, to your point, if you look at companies like Amazon, and I know Amazon has other problems in terms of how they're treating the employees and all that, and that might come back to bite them at some point. I don't know. But if you look at the singular vision of Jeff Bezos, and I, and I totally you know, tip my hat, that from day one, he said, we'll be customer obsessed. Yeah. And I'm quite yeah, sure he, right? So... I'm quite sure he didn't know what it meant in totality. And I'm sure he didn't know what it meant in 1997, what it means to them today. Yeah. But it was very clear that he was building and trying to build systems which would make it simple and easy for his customers to buy from him and take out all frictions wherever possible. That's a great example. Great example is Apple when they could actually push technologies which were not, I mean, you remember when this took out the 
DVD drive of your computer. My first reaction was, I, I can't function. And I'm an Apple guy. I've been mm. an Apple guy for the last 20 years. I said, I can't function. I need that DVD. But they were right. They knew what I needed before I could sort of figure out that I needed it. I know these are all oft repeated examples, but unfortunately, it's not that there are millions of examples of great customer obsession, which might manifest in different ways. Like what manifests in Amazon is not the same manifestation in case of, uh, case of Apple. Yeah, those two examples are, are well-known ones. Um, you know, in, in the last, I think it was in the last annual report, uh, Amazon's annual report, you know, they, they made it clear that we, we want to continue and, and, be, and maintain or become um, the most customer centric business in the world, right? And, and, and that is, you know, a, a, so many companies talk about customer centricity, but in, in my view, in my research and observation, less than 1% truly, truly are. Um, uh, and Apple, you know, it's interesting about the example that you use, because when people ask me about salespeople, for example, what are some of the qualities of incredible salespeople? One of the few qualities that I share is that they understand their customers so well that they're able to help them see around corners. So if you think about the, the people that you really trust, when you think about this, like you know, people that you call your real advisors, whether they're financial advisors, uh, medical advisors, you know, legal advisors, whatever it is, there is a difference between those that can help you solve a problem, but there is a difference between those that can help you identify a problem in the future that you probably are not aware of, but it's going to come to bite you in the ass in a big way later on. And those people we value in terms of trust far more than just the problem solvers, right? We still value the problem solvers, but those people that can help us avoid a problem, a big problem at that, um, we really value them a lot. And, and, and Apple almost kind of did that. It's, it's almost saying, this is where the future's going. You probably don't know that, but we do because we love you. There's going to be a little bit of pain in this process, but here's the point. And this was uh, written in the, um, the Challenger Customer book by one of my mentors, mm -hmm. uh, Matt Dixon. Um, the idea is to figure out in sales that and help the buyer see that the pain of same is greater than the pain of change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and there's always going to be an element of pain, but it's the question of, does the buyer see that they can go through that journey with you? And it will be even more harmful if they stayed where they are. So I want to, I want to talk about um, an important topic here that I know you have a lot to say about, which is sales in the SaaS world. What's your view about how sales is being conducted in the SaaS world in general? Okay, so I'll st take a step back and, and I will try to respond it in a slightly bigger canvas. If you look at the motivation of st startup founders in SaaS as well, the motivation is to grow at any cost. The motivation is not to run a profitable business. The motivation is to grow. And the current thought process of investing, and I may be crucified for saying this, is like a giant Ponzi scheme. It's, it's trying to find the next idiot who will come and buy whatever you are creating at a higher value than you have put in. When Netscape went public, it was a loss-making company, and it got some 28x value, so valued at $3 billion. And then later it was bought over, you know, delisted by uh, AOL and bought over for $10 billion and so on. And sort of set the tone that you can run a loss making enterprise and still make money and get out. So if you look at the narrative, the focus of millions of dollars chasing very ordinary businesses is that there'll be somebody who will be willing to pay more for that, that piece of action than what you are putting in. And so let's drive it towards that. So let's get more users in. So this whole addiction of 
acquisition as against retention is the core problem mm. right so which also means you are getting people inside the funnel or inside the pipe who actually have no business being there because you don't care for you it's that metric oh we grew 29% last quarter because we added 50000 more users or whatever that number is mm. right so so the the problem is we are we are actually encouraging unsustainable ideas because there is liquidity and what's happening is millions of people who are part of the failure so you know that vcs whatever vcs fund 10% of them succeed and 1% of them pay for all their up, upside yeah right so theoretically for every 100 businesses being funded 90 are failing and if you go in and look at what's going on there with the failures is that it's leaving millions of people including founders completely shattered and hopeless because nobody talks about them nobody cares about them including the vcs who are so adept at quoting them at at the beginning because all he's trying to do and i have nothing against vcs by the way they are doing it very well for themselves i am not trying to be judgmental at all i'm just saying the system now is rigged towards a scenario where you get rewarded for failing where other people will come and fund your failure and not the ones who are actually trying to build something in a sustainable manner so this whole idea of unsustainable growth is actually at the core of all the sales related issues that you see in saas so it's interesting that you mentioned that so and you said you wanted to take that slightly further back right and you talked about the founders which is interesting cuz that that was going to be one of my questions so talk to me about talk to me now about how the behaviors of those founders and the way that they are ingesting money you hinted at this in terms of you know we 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 are incentivizing growth at all costs um versus acquiring the right types of customers and retaining those customers so talk to me a bit more about how you are seeing in the in the because the area that you're the expert in is in saas businesses how are you seeing that manifest in terms of the behaviors of the sales people and i i'm mean, really interested in particular with how they behave with their customers what how are you seeing that manifest because of the way that these investors are working uh, working with founders if you remember we used to say why is the advertising so sexy and the user manual so boring yep right it's sort of the same thing in sales and i have experienced this personally i have seen this playing out over and over you are all over a customer when you are trying to acquire him you know shower attention workout deals give some sweeteners till you make them sign up and then look in any any hierarchy if you are the top 10 15% of the of the customers you can still manage to get attention and it's true for for any any business not 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 unique to say saas but Great. if you are just one of the regular users you will have a hell of a time trying to get support and i'm not again i'm not talking about the customer success but this whole movement about customer success for that matter right i mean customer success is not new this is this is not a new concept i mean uh, tisa actually uh, sort of uh, talked about it very clearly uh, way back in the 2000s right so there, there is enough literature about that so but, but the point i'm making is if you there are saas companies today which do not allow you to delete your credit card from their system and 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 these are big companies i don't want to name names but these are big companies so so to say they are part of the successful ones quote unquote okay so so the the, the what is the sales person who has joined you today seeing he's he he's being told growth at any cost acquire at any cost and after that don't bother just move on i, I don't know whether i'm 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 actually responding to your question but but you that's are. that's the culture that we are breeding in most companies 
you know it, when we talk of examples we'll we'll go and give one example of atlassian or one example of you know salesforce one example of hubspot and so on but they're like that fortune 500 right you, you cannot use them as an example for what's going on in the rest of the world which is why you need to be so so concerned about how people are behaving online how people are how, how is the mass connecting and behaving on twitter on facebook what are they talking? Why it, that is why it's so important because finally that's the reflection of society, not 50 people. So if you look at, I mean, I believe there are 20 million sales professionals in the US alone. What is the mass of that doing? What is it that the leadership is telling them? What is it that they're being, they're being incentivized for is what needs examination. Well, let, let's, let's examine that actually because what you what you share is is a, a topic that's close to my heart right um you know all, all those activities that you just said and the example being you can't even delete your credit card from their file i mean that is just basically a, a, a horrible way to do business and, and a horrible way to engage with your buyers and you're you're basically showing them that you can't be trusted right that you're trying to you're trying to pincer move them you're trying to block them through unethical and in the wrong way trying to trying to stick them right and create stickiness stickiness yeah. should be in terms of incredible value not trying to trick you and trying to block you right so that, that that i'm so glad that you mentioned that so let's talk about incentives right because incentives uh you know we we don't need to have an, a degree in neuroscience to know this if you incentivize for certain things then the smart people will figure out how to get the most of it right um so let's talk about those incentives. What are your thoughts on how salespeople are being incentivized right now? You can slice and dice it any which way, but the, the basic premise remains the same. That will give you a little money, which is what you'll take home, even if you don't perform, so to say, but you'll be fired. That's a different issue, but we'll give you a little money. But your cream is going to come from your attaining quota that we are going to fix for you. That's it. So essentially, you are a neurotic guy who needs to get the quota to feed the family. You know, actually, I'll step aside and say there is absolutely no basis for incentivizing salespeople without incentivizing the rest of the company. I, I, think, I think incentivization should go completely. It's bad practice. Mm. It's not a question of how you do it. There is no reason for incentivizing salespeople because all they're doing is a job, which is the same thing that the guy who is building the product is doing. It's the same thing that the marketing guy is doing who is, who is build, building the brand and bringing you know, potential customers into the, in, into the ambit of the brand. It is the same thing that the customer success guys are doing who are actually contributing towards ensuring that the delivery happens and retention happens and so on. So if you're running a a just company, mm. there is no case for incentivizing salespeople and not the rest. I'm, I'm all for incentivizing as long as it's for everybody. So just to be clear, Sabanjan, are you suggesting that, because um, it's, it's a topic that I'm grappling with, with other clients, with parts of my community, are you suggesting that there should be equity in terms of, sorry, an equitable structure of incentivization i.e for example a bonus structure that's for everyone including sales and that everyone outside of sales gets the same level of equitable calculation of that bonus or are you saying that <clears throat> it's okay to incentivize sales a little bit higher in connection with deals that they bring in or retain the rest of the business would get a bonus, but sales will get less of that bonus or none of that bonus, but there's still some form of equitable distribution or equitable calculation of that money. So almost like a hybrid approach. So just to be clear, which, which kind of scenario yeah. are you describing or, or is there a different scenario that you're thinking of? Well, well, it's a bit of both. I, I, I do not have uh, a formula which I can put out and say, okay, this works for everybody. I think that will be a little 
presumptuous on my part i mean uh, i i do not i i do not know exactly what happens what goes on what effort translates into business and revenue what effort of the product being flawless and the customer support being flawless and the customer education being flawless and customer development being flawless and the sales process being flawless so so all these things i i am not here to say okay the weightage is same or weightage is like 1.5 for sales and 2.5 for this i i think i leave that to individual leaders but be very clear that it has to be a equitable system which brings the entire company into the picture so if we are having a good year it is not that the sales guy has gone home with half a million dollars and the product guy uh, you know gets a laptop that doesn't work yeah you know so we we have to be sort of clear and 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 the first thing is that we have to treat sales people as human beings and pay them more to start with i think i think this whole idea that sales people live for incentive is again this industrial era thought process mm. traveling salesmen who will go from town to town and because they are hard working because of, i mean i think that's that's gone i i don't know what we are talking about that's interesting so you're you're advocating you're not you're not you're not advocating that sales people shouldn't receive incentives you're advocating that actually the proportion of how much incentive sales people get versus the rest of the business who are crucial to winning and retaining clients is skewed it's wrong and even in some companies where the rest of the business barely get anything but the sales pe- sales people get the lion's share so some people will argue that that obviously sales people's job is harder but we won't go down that road because that that that's a that's a big topic and i think i think i think we know what your answer might be which is no without the others it, it would just never be successful right you can't sell or flog a bad product because at some point in in a, ra- a radically transparent and radically competitive world it's just going to be noticed and and you're going to lose that business um <clears throat> so i get that um in your view then so let's talk let's let's move on to the topic of because we talked about founders uh, we've talked about the investors we've talked about the sales incentives and and the behaviors let's talk about the behaviors of the sales leaders now right because you know uh cb which is part of now gartner you know a company that was a commercial director for uh, you know we did a study where we found that actually we were the, we we also did the study that you you mentioned before around you know um it was actually 57% you know that buyers are 57% of the way in their buyer's journey before they even engage with a salesperson but that's that's something else um we also found that um coaching um first line managers because they're critical to the growth of the business more so in some ways than than the more senior level um sales leaders but those who are actively managing the people who are at the front end of the market those that have a consistent coaching culture can improve um sales performance by about 19% so it has a big difference but the, the the way in which those sales managers lead and and work with their frontline sales staff is is vital to the growth of a business what are your observations and th- thoughts and opinions around the behaviors of those sales managers and therefore the behaviors that they are uh, encouraging or or attributing to to their sales people i have limited knowledge about training uh, although i talk to a lot of trainers themselves and and lot of uh, sales leaders uh, i will not exceed my brief but this is what i'll say unless we change the lens through which we are looking at the selling process whatever you do will be wrong it's like diagnosing for a wrong wrong disease and mm. and administering great medicine uh, it doesn't matter it's not the fault of the medicine it's not the fault of the training that you are imparting but if your diagnosis is wrong if you're training for the wrong thing then the outcome is going to be horrible so it's it's the 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 problem i think is we are 
as I said, if, if you go back to where we started, the crossroad, if we are not seeing that the buyer has changed, the buyer is not buying the way the buyer used to buy 20 years back. And we continue to, so you, you told about cold calling, right? That we cannot cold call anymore. What was the sales response and technology response to cold calling when people were not picking up the phone? Oh, we'll create something called robocall because you don't have to make the call. I will have a computer make those calls so that on an average, you still get through like 10 people. Yeah. We completely ignored the fact that people have stopped picking up the phone. And of course, nothing is absolute. So, I mean, I, I, I know somebody will say, who said some people have picked up, uh, stopped picking up the phone. They do pick up the phone. Oh, nowadays they pick it up more and so on and so forth. I mean, I know those debates, but I'll not get there. But the point I'm making is the response to the fact that buyers do not want to be interrupted while buying needs to be understood. Hmm. The fact that we are living in a permission economy where you can engage with a person only with permission. How many unsolicited LinkedIn requests do you get, Moid? Uh, not to me? connect. Yeah. 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 So not to connect. They're straight away asking you, oh, we do this. You should consider this. You have no idea who I am, what I know. And I can see that you're a greenhorn. If I go to your, go to your profile, I'll see that you have three years of working experience as against my 30. And you're trying to tell me what I should do today. I should consider doing WhatsApp promotion. I should consider using LinkedIn for whatever, you know? So the problem, problem is that we need to change the lens. We need to see that crossroad. We need to understand that deviation is not going anywhere anymore. It is heading to a mine which has stopped stop producing the minerals that we need. We have mm. to take a different road. And if you don't do that, it doesn't matter what empathy or what good intention we come in as, as leaders, we are not going to deliver the result that is required. Right. So, so let's talk practical then. <clears throat> Using your example of you know, LinkedIn outreach, whatever the outreach is actually, yeah. the channel doesn't matter. It's the intention and the purpose. How yes. should salespeople reach out to buyers right now, considering what you said about the way that people buy is completely different now to what it was 20, 30 years ago, which by the way, I completely agree. It cannot be argued. It's very clear. For whatever reason, salespeople have not changed the way they, that they sell. That's fine. We've talked about that. So how should people outreach to potential yeah. buyers? Yeah. So, so first is if you have an urgent need to sell don't contact people because you'll not be able to do it what i mean is don't reach out to somebody thinking you can get him to buy something from you in your calendar we, we discussed this earlier right buyers are not buying because you have a quota to fulfill or you have a target to meet or you have you it is about the other guy you have to understand that and you have to be willing. And that's where, see, a lot of times when I discuss it, it seems as if, oh, Shumanjan wants to blame the leadership. No, I mean, if a, I mean, parents are not the only influence on a child if the child is going astray. But you cannot say the parent had no role in it at all, right? It, it's uh, the same for, for business, it's the same. So when you're the leader, you cannot say, I didn't know. I didn't know that COVID second wave is coming. That was your job. That's why you were put there. That's why you're the leader. Don't say that, oh, nobody knew how to handle a thing like COVID. Then you resign your job. Don't sit there. You know what I mean? So coming back to sales, you, you have to understand that, I mean, of course, if you're selling a commodity, $10, uh, th that discussion is separate. But I'm saying any kind of serious business to business outreach has to start with what you actually elaborated earlier with the defined intention of understanding the buyer. It's that's easier said than done. And it is not going to play out with a intention which is driving the need for instant gratification. It's not going to work that way. 
you can be lucky you can be lucky i mean you can always come back and tell a story i closed this you know 50000 dollar deal in 3 days you are lucky it's sort of like buying lotto and 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 somebody picking your number it happens it's not that it doesn't happen but those are rare instances you cannot run your life by that so so your question was how should we do it one you have to know how to identify the people who will benefit from what you have to offer it is not that generic stuff oh i am building something for people who drive two wheelers or i'm building something no no it's not all two wheelers will benefit from you 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 have to really dig down and say okay two wheelers who use this kind of tires drives on this kind of tracks and typically drives during the day or during the night will benefit and then go to them and start understanding whether your hypothesis is sort of mm. matching the reality because so just, the reality just to clarify just to clarify sorry for interrupting just to clarify you're talking about understanding your ideal customer profile at a certain level of degree of knowledge that's pretty pretty detailed yes and then you have a proposition that you come to them with about them rather than it's about you right? absolutely so all from their perspective right yes yes that will that will not that will not guarantee the sale though No, of in my not. mind that will guarantee a seat at the table yes because all the other factors of trust of wanting to engage with you as a human being i i think i can talk to moid i th- i think he's a guy who will who will not tell me things which he cannot deliver or he will give me inputs which will be not just because he wants to give me something or sell me something that once you do and you get a seat at the table with the clarity that now when the actual requirement is defined you should have the uh, you know the honesty and character to say moid i don't think i can fulfill this i know i can do about 80% mm. but i can't go the whole way and i think you are better off going with robert or jane or whoever because i think they are they will also not be able to do 100% but they will do more than what i can do and i would have told you that i'll do it if i if this was on my road map it's not even in my road map that's a scary thing yes for a sales person and especially for 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 business leaders to want to do yeah. right because the 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 common um the common convention right is mm-hmm. you know say yes to everything and we will figure it out along the way yeah you're basically yeah. saying actually recommend a competitor if they truly yeah. can do a better job than we can yeah and i can share with you instances where the rare people who have done that actually got recommended by this cust- customer prospect who they passed over mm. they they started coming to this guy they never bought from him they started coming to him for advice for all new projects yes and eventually ended up buying five times the value yeah that he had passed on that day i know it's anecdotal i know it's anecdotal i i know i i know of instances i don't want to talk about them i i cannot tell you 100 stories like this i can tell maybe five mm. but this happens and in many instances these are the guys this prospective buyers customers have recommended that go to mohit because he's a honest guy i think he can do what you what you need and if he can't he will tell you so you can trust him completely Mm. and yeah. you know the best form of sales leads are referrals right absolutely where where the prospect will call up and say you know you know shubhanjan you, you need to go to uh, go to mohit or uh, mohit you need to go to shubhanjan because he has a requirement i think you will fulfill and i've already told him about you go and talk to him and he's going to buy yeah. now go you know as you will know i conducted that research with almost 400 buyers in the last 15 years on just this very topic which is what made you buy from a particular sales person whether it was a, in a competitive bid or a non-competitive structure um every one of them used one of two words or or both trust and honesty so i have examples and instances and i've done these myself so so, so a couple of examples have come for me only two but i've got other examples in which 
although very few, right? So it's still something that's very much against the grain. So I see now why you talk about changing the way that sellers sell, right? A new way of selling. Um, but that approach is incredibly powerful. Now, we're not, just to be clear to all our viewers and listeners, we're not advocating that if you can't do 100% of it, you automatically refer them to a competitor because it could be that the customers, that 20% that you can't do, that the customer's requesting, actually won't be of any value to the customer, right? You remember, your job at the end is to help them make the right, right decisions. You're a decision-making agent. But if it comes to the point that they really need it and you know for sure that a competitor can do a better service than you can, you should absolutely recommend them because you're thinking about the long game. And here's the problem, Shabanjan, we're not incentivized, we're not structured, we don't live in an environment where we can do that. But this truly is a new way of doing things. And I, I really hope that all the founders that are watching and listening to this podcast really take note about this because the way you establish your values and your culture of your business will have a big influence on the type of investors that you seek to, to come along in the journey with you. Right. If your intention is to sell and, and stroke your ego in five years time, you're going to look for investors that align to those values. But if your intention is to create an incredible business that has longevity uh, in, in value to the community that you're serving, then you're going to look for investors like that. So I'm really glad and happy that we we've brought you onto the show, because I think you've shared things that are very provocative and need to be heard by both the business leadership community and the sales community at large as well. Um, so before we wrap up, a couple of questions that I would like to ask you, Shivanjan. Um, so the first question is, um, who is your greatest influence or source of information right now? Who, who, do, you, who do you love to learn from uh, that you would like to share with our community? You, you know, it is so wonderful that we live in this era and some of us who have seen the previous era and and this era that any knowledge is today accessible and and my answer is actually the internet okay mm. because all my influence all my inspiration all my information just lives there all i have to go do is go and go and look at it i mean i can name i can name names i mean I, I can name names, but and it it'll be a long list. Honestly, it's it's not a one person or two people. Uh, I, I I don't. I, I meet inspiring people every day, and they become lifelong friends, and we talk, and we chat, and we exchange, and it's happening all the time, right? Mm. Uh, so so I know it's a it's not a very very uh, a sexy answer, but 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 really, it's it's the internet. I th I think it's it's so wonderful. We we, we <laughs> this this abundance of knowledge that is there at our fingertips and anybody who needs it, anybody who wants anything, you can access. I mean, somebody can access you through LinkedIn, reach out and ask for advice. And I'm quite certain, you know, anytime, you know, I have, I, I'm not a very well connected person on LinkedIn, but I have maybe 7,000 connections. Okay. Uh, there are people who have 30,000 connections, 40,000 connections. Anyway, I have 7,000 connections and I'm on LinkedIn I think more than 10 years, I think, uh, or, or close to that. You know, only handful of people have actually reached out to me and asked for advice. And every time they've done that, I have responded. On the flip side, every time I have reached out to anybody for genuinely have reached out for advice, not as a disguised pathway to say, making a sale, right? People have responded. People like to respond. People like to respond to people when they ask for information, ask for guidance, ask for inputs, ask for uh, feedback. People are very generous with that. And I think this whole era of abundance that we are in, we are not making great use of it. Yeah, here, here. I agree with you on that for sure. Um, I, I, I remember in school, one question I was asked to find the answers for was name the number of countries within the European Economic Union. <laughs> and this was in the 90s, right? Early 90s. Uh, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't answer the, the only way that I could answer the question was to either go to a library and find a current book that would have that information or ask my parents, um, who knew the answers, right? But who knew the answer, but, but, or ask someone else. 
um, uh, you know, and, and that was difficult. Whereas now all I have to do is just tap away and type it and that was it, right? And you get the answer. Yeah. So, so I'm with you there. And um, uh, so that was, that was great to hear. Um, <clears throat> the other question, the other question I would like to ask is, if there was one thing that you wish that you had learned or that you wish you appreciated more earlier in your life. So looking back now on the, on the older and hopefully wiser Shivanjan, you know, what would, what, what was the one thing that you wish you'd either learned or appreciated earlier in your life? Because it would have made a really, really big difference to your, to your path, your growth, etc. Yeah. I have actually two. Great. And, and, and these are not necessarily in any order. The first thing is that start with the customer. Mm. So I have had my shares of, because see, as, as creative people who are building things, it's very easy to fall in love with what you are doing and postponing going to the customer because that might result in rejection. It is sort of the same psychology that you like this girl so much in college, but you will never go and propose to her because what if she rejects? So it's better to be in that whole thought process of, yes, it might work and sort of be in that immersed rather than looking at reality. So start with the customer. That's, that's, that's the first one. The other thing is end things that you begin. If you look at our lives, I mean, as I said, human beings are creative, right? I mean, I don't have to say that. We are all very creative people. We have lots of things that we want to do. There are lots of things we aspire for and so on and so forth, right? And we begin a, quite a few of those, but we also give up very quickly. Uh, I think, I think if, if we can make it a habit of ending what you begin, a lot, lot more of us will be a lot more satisfied with life. Yeah. That's huge. That's that's hugely interesting. Interesting. So, begin with the customer, and complete or finish what you start. Yeah. Um, so that that was really interesting, Shivanjan. I've really enjoyed. I've really enjoyed our discussion today. Really enjoyed our discussion. Um, Thank you. How can how can our viewers and listeners? Uh, where can they go to learn more about you and, and what you're doing? Yeah. So I mean, uh, I run a SaaS company which is Pitchlink. Uh, if you are a salesperson, check it out. But the best way to reach me is LinkedIn. Just, just come to LinkedIn, reach out to me. And if you have a legitimate interest, I'm very happy to connect and share my two cents. Great. And, and, and we'll leave, um, <clears throat> we'll put the links in the, in the notes so that people can easily access them. Uh, Shubhanjan, sure. again, thank you for, for, joining, um, for joining us in this podcast session. Uh, it was fantastic to have you here and to hear your, 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 your observations, your opinions and what you've seen um, in the world of SaaS um, and in the world of uh, sales, especially within the SaaS community. Um, so, you know, what I would like our listeners to, to take away from this is, you know, think about the customer's journey right now. It's completely different to what it was 30, 20, 30 years ago, maybe even different than what it was actually was 10 years ago. Yes. And have a look at your sales process and the way that you're doing business and the behaviors that you're rewarding and encouraging. And are they congruent with how the buyer likes to buy? Right. Um, this is not to say that you should do everything that the buyer wants. Otherwise, we'd probably go out of business. They would want it for free, but um, or at least for a low price. But how can we become more closely aligned to the buyer's journey to have the buyer in mind? Think about the buyer first, as you say. And how are we doing business that is congruent with um, doing that with the buyer, but also working with buyers who would truly value what we do. They'll get the most value out of what you can offer them. And that's where the ideal customer profile comes in play. So um, <clears throat> great session and thank you, Shivanjan. Um, and until the next video, thank you everyone for joining us in this session and we'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. Thank you, Maitha.